amen and amen. Wonderful. Thank you so much. In your Bible today, the book of Genesis, chapter number 2. As I speak about the creation of the first woman and the first marriage. Genesis chapter 2, stand with me please as we read God's Word together. Genesis 2 and 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. And that was last week's message as we went into detail about that from chapter 1 and 2. Now, beginning or continuing in verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And in verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. For out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air, to the beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an helpmeet for him. And so the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her into the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Thank you, and you may be seated. And so we have the creation of the first man. God said in verse number 7 of chapter 2, that he breathed unto the man, unto the, man the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. I want you to remember that this is the only case of absolute direct creation where God literally breathed it, took his spirit, and transferred his spirit into the body of someone or something else. And it happened to be the man. In verse 15, we read that God put him in a specially prepared place. There was a special environment for him. It's called the Garden of Eden. I talked about this Wednesday night as I preached in this same passage. And the Garden of Eden was paradise. It was perfect, perfect in every way that an environment could be made into perfection. God put him there to live, but also he gave him his job description. He is to dress it, according to verse 15, and he is to keep it. He is, according to other places, to classify and name the creatures that are in the garden. Here was Adam's job. This was his purpose. He is to name the creatures. He is to classify them. He is to organize the garden, organize the world as it were. In verse number 15, we also find, or in verse 18, rather, we, we have the first not good, the first negative in all the Bible. Now, seven times in chapter number one, seven different times, God said, it's good. He looked at the things he had made, and he declared them to be good. But now we come to chapter two, and in verse number 18, God says, Something is not good. And what is it that's not good? What is it that God says needs to be changed or improved, if you will? Well, we're usually told that Adam needed companionship. In most of the messages I've heard on this, and I've even preached it myself, and it's not untrue, it is true, 
Adam, no doubt, was lonely. He was the only one of his species existing upon the earth, and he needed a partner. He needed companionship. He needed to love and be loved. That's the nature of a human being. But I don't think it's the main thing. As I've studied this time, I've discovered something new. I don't think that's the reason God says it's not good that he be alone. The reason I believe God said it's not good if he is alone is because back in chapter 1 and verse number 28, God had said that this man is to have dominion over the entire creation. He is to replenish the earth, meaning to fill it up, to populate it, if you will. And not only is he to populate it, he is to subdue it, and he is to rule over it, to have dominion over it. He can't do that by himself. It's going to require a vast, vast population of human beings to repop or to populate, to replenish, to subdue, to fill up this entire planet. And so he needs a wife. He needs another of his species. He needs reproduction, if you will. And so God said, it's not good that he stay alone. If we're going to accomplish my purpose for the earth, we're going to have to fill it up and subdue it and bring it under dominion. That's going to take millions and millions of people. And so God made the first woman. Here in verse number 18, he said, it's not good that the man would be alone. I will make him a helpmeet, a helpmeet, and helper meet for him, if you will. And uh, that's an interesting word. You don't hear it anywhere else much except here in the Bible, a helpmeet. It literally means one who is suitable for him, one who corresponds to him in every way, physically, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually. It means one who will complete him. He is perfect. Adam was perfect at this point, but he was not complete. He was not complete in the sense that he couldn't reproduce himself. And so he needs the woman. The woman is the completer. She is the one who absolutely rounds out God's vision for humanity. If you remember what God said back in verse 26 of chapter number 1, that God, God said, let's make man in our image in verse 27. He said, the image of God requires them to be male and female. So the image of God could not be absolutely completed by just one of our species. The image of God required men and women. And so God didn't make this woman from the dust of the earth. He used a different process. Only the man is made from that. So God put Adam into a deep sleep. The very first surgical procedure. I mean, it's, ma it's major surgery, isn't it? <laughs> it's major surgery because he's going to create this wonderful creature the woman here. And the Hebrew word is tsala, T-S-A-L-A, tsala. And it's usually translated, most of the time in the Bible, it's translated sad, like the side of the mountain would be the same word. But in this case, it's the rib, meaning taken from the very side, the body of Adam himself. And so God took bone, the rib. He took flesh. He took blood. And from that, only God could do what he did. He formed the woman. I want you to keep your hand there, and I want you to turn in the Bible to the book of Zechariah, not one you turn too often. So it's two back from the New Testament, okay? You have Matthew, Malachi, Zechariah, if you're going backwards in your Bible. Zechariah Chapter number 12, chapter 12 of the prophecy of Zechariah. And I want you to see something that really you ought to underline it in your Bible. It's a very, very important phrase here hidden away in this little prophecy. 
Zechariah 12 and 1, the burden of the Lord, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord. And then it talks about his creative work, who stretcheth forth the heavens, and he layeth the foundation of the earth. And here it is, underline this, he formeth the spirit of man within him. He formeth the spirit of man within him, within the man. God is the one who forms the spirit. So he made her body from the side of Adam, the blood, the flesh, the bone of Adam himself, his own body. But then he put in her the spirit. It is the Lord who formeth the spirit in him. I believe this. The Bible doesn't say this absolutely directly. It certainly infers it. I believe every time a baby is born that God forms the spirit within that child. That's the divine part of that little, of that little baby. And so we see God forming her spirit. Now, the point I want to make in that is that we know that Adam became a living soul and spirit. Adam is made of a body, a soul, and a spirit. We went over that last week. But now we see that Eve is the same. She is a body physically taken from his side. But she too is a soul. She has a mind, emotions, and will. That's what constitutes the soul. And God formed within her the spirit here it says. Now, she's taken from his side, not his head, so she's not supposed to dominate him. Amen, women? Huh? She's not to dominate him. She's from the side, not the head, and she's not fr from the feet. And we men are not to dominate her. Amen? From the side, they're equals in life. Who does God love more, men or women? Uh-huh. He loves them both, doesn't he? Because they're both made in his image. They're an equality. One is not to be the dominant one over the other. I know what it says about submission, and we'll take that in due course of time. But the point is, God wants both men and women to bear his image, Genesis 1 and 26. Now, if you talk, went out on the street today and talked to 100 people and said, do you believe that Adam and Eve were literal historical figures and they were the first man and woman and people have been taught about Cro-Magnum man and Neanderthal man and all these crude figures that I gave you pictures of last week? Do you believe that Adam and Eve, do you believe in the historicity of Adam and Eve that they were in fact the very first human beings, historic people? literal people? And I would say to you overwhelmingly, absolutely, yes, I do. And you do too if you believe the Bible, if the Bible is your authority on this. Because you may want to write these down. 1 Timothy 2.13. 1 Timothy 2 and 13. Adam was first formed and then Eve. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 8. The man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. And so the New Testament, even our Lord himself in Matthew 19, refers to Adam and Eve and to the writings of Moses as, being, as describing the first man and the first woman who ever lived. They were historical figures. They were the first, the first man, the first woman according to the Word of God. And then Adam named the woman himself. Go over to chapter 3 and verse 20, and your Bible says that Adam, I guess he's about the only man who ever named his wife, huh? Usually she has a name when she comes to you, but in this case, he named his wife, and he called her Eve. And that's an interesting name. It meant life. And you could see why he would name her that, because there was no possibility of more life until she came along, and so God gave him this companion, this woman, made from him, but now together they are going to reproduce life, and they're going to carry out God's dominion mandate 
of chapter 1 and verse 28. Fill up the earth, rule over it, have dominion over it, and now they are ready to do so. But there's one other thing. Before they do that, there's got to be a marriage. God has given the pattern for us even in our day. And so in chapter 2 and verse 24 and 5, this is the definitive definition and principle of marriage throughout your entire Bible. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. In other words, marriage begins with leaving the families where you were reared, where you were born, where you were raised, and the man shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You can describe marriage pretty easily. It is a leaving, it is a cleaving, it is a becoming one flesh, a total unity of two persons. Let me say, and I don't want you to miss this, marriage, ladies and gentlemen, and there's more misunderstanding about marriage today, maybe any one word I could, I could say from this pulpit, and there's not a word that I need to talk about more than marriage in 2022. The whole world has blown it on this subject. They are confused about it like never before. But I want to say, number one about marriage, marriage is a theological issue. It is a theological issue. I mean by that it comes from the teachings of God Himself from the Bible. Marriage is, first of all, a theological issue. You know why that needs to be said and said authoritatively? Because people today think marriage is just a legal issue, that you have to buy a license the license is of the state. It has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with marriage as defined in the Bible. And then other people see it as being a traditional thing. Well, this is just what we do. This has just evolved over time as a good way for people to create families. No, that may be true too, but it's not primary. And other people say, well, it's a social uh, invention that we've come with through the years. We found out the best way to make a family work, so it's social. It is legal. Marriage is legal. Marriage is traditional. Marriage is social. But before it was any of those things, before it was any of those things, it was of God. It's theological in its nature. It began with God. He's the one who invented it. I, I, I challenge you, it didn't come out of the bride's magazine. It, it was not invented at the bridal shop. It has nothing to do with cakes and candles and rings. It has everything to do with the inventor of it, Almighty God. He initiated marriage. He created sex. He's all for sex. He is, it's his idea from start to finish. And he gave us the best and most authoritative book ever written, a wonderful bride's manual and a wonderful groom's manual. It tells us what to do and how to do it and when to do it and where to do it. <laughs> You look stunned <laughs> because you're not used to hearing it said like that, are you? No, you're not. But you're hearing the truth. Right here is the beginning of marriage. And honestly, just about all you really need to know to have a good marriage. If you didn't have anything in the world, if you didn't have one single bride's book, never been to the bride's shop, never had a white dress, never had a candle, never had a ring, never cut a cake, you'd still know all you need to know about having a good marriage if you just take this and read it and begin to apply it every day in your life. Amen? Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking the truth, y'all. Verse 24, what is marriage? A man leaves his father and his mother, starts a new life, a new family unit. 
He cleaves unto his wife. That means he glued to her. He is glued to her. They can never part, and they shall be one flesh. I'll give you a definition. This is the best I can define it. And I spent a lot of time on these few words, but I'm reading it straight off of my outline here. Marriage is a lifelong, binding, holy covenant between a man and a woman and God. It involves physical intimacy, emotional support, mutual encouragement, and spiritual unity. The total unity of a man and a woman. Let me give it to you again. Marriage is a lifelong, permanent, binding, cleaving, glued to, holy, covenant, contract, agreement between a man and a woman and God, and it involves physical intimacy, emotional support, mutual encouragement, and spiritual unity. How am I doing, Norma? I'm looking at her taking my cues here. You know, I've I got to be careful what I say. I got a witness, don't I? You know what God's marriage math is? God has marriage math, I call it. It's one plus one equals one. The rest of the world, it's one plus one equal two. But when God has his marriage math, it's one, a man, and one woman equals one. They are total unity. That's marriage. That's why 2 Corinthians 6 and 14 warns you against marrying outside the faith. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know what? The, the most binding yoke on this earth, the closest relationship, the most binding relationship you'll ever be in is marriage. And if you're yoked with an unbeliever, you cannot have the unity. It's impossible. By, by definition, it's impossible to ha have that one flesh relationship that the Bible describes as being for marriage. Now, turn your Bible, Matthew 19, and let's look at what Jesus said about marriage real quick. And G Jesus absolutely reaffirmed here the Genesis model for us. And uh, you can read it from the screen even to save time. He answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, Jesus said? And then he said, For this cause, the cause being marriage, a man will leave there, he says it again, father and mother, and cleave to his wife, so closely that they will be one flesh, and wherefore they are no more two, but they're one. And what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. It's a permanent relationship. So if you're taking some notes with me, you have a place in your Bible, won't you write down three or four words I want to give to you here that I think will help you. Actually, three words completely describe a biblical worldview about marriage here. Number one, it's monogamous. It's monogamous. It's one man and one woman for life. It's exclusive. No other people allowed. Kids are not involved in this. Friends are not involved. Parents are not involved. Exclusively monogamous. One man, one woman. That's why he keeps saying, cleave unto his wife. She cleaves into her husband. It's a pledge of fidelity. You know, the old word they used to use, the old English word is wedlock. They quit using that. It means when you get wedded, you're locked in. You understand why they don't want to say that today, don't you? <laughs> we got easy divorce and, you know, no-fault divorce, and you can get out. It's not locked. But the old days... They, people understood wedlock. It is a monogamous, exclusive relationship. Number two, it's heterosexual. 
There's no such thing as gay marriage. Gay marriage cannot meet the biblical definition. There's no such thing. People talk about traditional marriage. Really, it isn't traditional. They talk about gay marriage. No such thing. It's just marriage. It's biblical marriage as God depicts it here. He's the one who defines the terms, is he not? There was a weak amen. Jesus said male and female in these verses. In some ways, the sexual relationship is marriage. You understand that? I got kids in here. I don't want to be too graphic. And yet, I want to tell you, the ceremony doesn't make it a marriage. The vows don't make it a marriage. The ring doesn't make it a marriage. The kiss doesn't make it marriage. The marriage license doesn't make it marriage. The one thing that makes it marriage is the one flesh conjugal sexual relationship. That's why we say the marriage is not consummated. When they kiss at the altar, it's consummated later. I'm talking to you like a father. You understand what I'm saying, don't you? And so it's impossible if it's not a heterosexual thing. It, it's consummated by becoming one flesh. The third word, it's monogamous, it's heterosexual, and thirdly, Jesus said it's permanent. Permanent. Don't let anybody put it asunder. Don't let anybody divide you. It is a lifetime, it is a once-in-a-lifetime commitment to one another. And through the centuries, boy, people have tried every deviation from God's standard that their minds could come up with. We've tried polygamy, one man and several wives. We've tried Philandry, one woman and several husbands. We've tried adultery. We've tried open marriages. We've tried premarital. We've tried extramarital relationships. We've tried concubines. You read about that in the Bible. We still have concubines. You know that? You know what the definition of a concubine is? It is living together and having sexual privileges without a marriage contract. We just don't call it concubines. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but if, ladies, if you're living with a man and you never bear, have bothered to get married, you're a concubine. It's called concubinage. That's the legal definition of it from the past. It's living together and having sexual privileges without a marriage covenant. And I want to warn you, ladies, I mean, he may be the biggest hunk since uh, the green guy on TV. <laughs> but do you know something? You're going to be the loser. You're going to be the loser. He gets all the privileges, and you move, he moves out, and you're gone. I mean, you, you, it's over for you. Don't go in. Don't fall for that. And Today it's so common. We even call it common law, don't we? Every deviation from God's standard has ended in disaster. Every one of those experiments. And so what is God's plan for sexuality? And I want you to listen. I'll go as quickly as I can. We're running a little bit late there. We had some extra stuff, but boy, on this holy week, Hear the word of the Lord. That's all i got to say. Number one, God's plan for human sexuality. Number one, heterosexual sex is the only sanctified and holy practice of sexuality. God created sex. God created the sexual organs. God created sexual desire. And then God gave us instructions for how to use it. Does that make sense? God created sex, the sexual organs, the desire, and the, then gave us instructions for how to use it. And sex as designed by God is holy. Hear me on that. 
when I hear people say, oh, you Christians think it's dirty, you know what? No, we don't. You don't understand the Bible. You've been listening to somebody who didn't know what they were talking about. God is the designer of sex, and it is holy. It's encouraged within marriage. It's men who have made it dirty. It's Hollywood and the pornographers. It's made it filthy and vile and despicable and shameful through their rebellion to what God said. Heterosexual sex is the only sanctified and holy practice of sexuality between male and female. Number two, heterosexuality is sanctified only within the covenant of marriage. It's got to be heterosexual, but it's also got to be within marriage. And by the way, that's not just for Christians. That's for all of creation. Any practice of sexuality outside of marriage ultimately brings God's judgment. Now, I don't have time to develop that point, but I could, I could argue that point strongly. And I, I do feel I could win it. You see, um, in our world, premarital sex is accepted. Oh, just boys will be boys. Let them be boys. You, that's okay if you've got a boy and you don't care anything about girls, but if you've got a little girl, you don't, you don't want anybody around with that philosophy. And then the extramarital, well, you know, um, he's having a midlife crisis. No, he's not. He's having a sinful flourish right now is what he's having. And the culture said, well, there's nothing wrong with sex between two consenting adults, is there? You're not so legalistic, so narrow, so rigid, Monroe, that you believe that it's wrong if they're two consenting adults? Don't you believe in freedom? I do believe in freedom, but I'm not a libertine. I believe in freedom within the boundaries that God has set for that freedom to be exercised. Ordered liberty is what we've always called it. I don't have time today to take you to Leviticus chapter 18 through 20, but just make a notation if you want to. God deals there with every issue we're dealing with today of sexual sin. Leviticus chapters 18 through 20. It was written 3,400 years ago, and it's just as relevant today as this morning's headlines, whatever they may be. In Exodus, in Leviticus 18 through 20, you will read about incest, and we call it abuse. You will read about fornication. We call it premarital sexuality. You will read about adultery. We call it extramarital sexuality. You will read about homosexuality. Two people of the same sex having a sexual relationship. You will read about transsexuality. People who dress and seek and live as if they were the other sex. You will even read, and I'm embarrassed to say it, you will even read about bestiality. And if you think it doesn't exist, it has been prosecuted in our court in Florence in the last three years. Every deviation from the standard ends up a wreck, physically, morally, spiritually, emotionally. This is God's plan. And the third point and the last one, marital sexuality alone can be holy shameless, honorable, and good. In verse 25, they were not ashamed. There was perfect unity, perfect trust. They were so secure with one another, they weren't worried about what their partner thought about their body. They had developed this intimacy, this relationship of love and trust to the point that they were not ashamed, it says. Well, the first woman, the first marriage, and God's plan for how that is to be carried out sexually. When I began the book of Genesis, I told you, reading Genesis 1 through 11 is like reading the morning front page of the New York Times. Is that relevant? 
God's book doesn't go out of style. Our faith is not trendy. Our faith is truthful. It's based on truth. And here is God's truth. And I, I can't tell you families, the blessings and joys of a Christian home are worth every minute of study and effort you will ever put into it. The blessings and joys of a Christian home are the greatest. It's the nearest to heaven and paradise you will ever have on this earth is your home and your family. Value it. Protect it. Study and see what God's way is for you. As we stand together with our heads bowed, please.